Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Wrestling Underground Podcast. I am your host, as always, Chad Bardo, and joining me is the glorious one himself, Marcus Green. Marcus, welcome to another night of wrestling dumbness. How are you? Good. This is going to be an interesting one for sure. So, it's been a long day. Been a long week. Been a long year. Been a long decade. Two years into it. Not even. The WWE has already had... I don't even know how many people fired. 100, Marcus? Is that, is that like the, what the number is? Not counting staffers? Yeah. And we get more releases. Last, what was it, last Friday, last Thursday? Again, after we were off the air. Of course. But some of these are surprising, to say the least. Um, so let's, let's go through who was let go. If I miss anyone, uh, let me, uh, uh, let me know and help me out. So first and foremost, Nia Jax, she got fired. Karrion Cross and Scarlet Bordeaux, uh, Keith Lee, Eva Marie, Mia Yim, Ember Moon, uh, Grand Metalik and Lindsay Dorato, Oni Lorcan, Frankie Monet, Harry Smith, which makes me laugh. We also saw Trey Baxter, who is known as Blake Christian, get released. Uh, B-Fab, Brianna Brandy. Oh, I didn't realize that was a female in that group. I thought it was the big dude. Jeet Rama, uh, Jesse Camilla, Zeta Ramir, and Catalina Garcia. Now, most of these names, Marcus, I don't, I don't fucking know. I don't know who Catalina Garcia is. But some of them are pretty big names. Are you at all surprised that some of these got uh, uh, ended up uh, getting 86 Surprised by these names? Some of them, yeah. Are you? Yeah, a couple, a few. Um, but even some of the, the big ones, like when you look at how they've been treated, releasing them might have been putting them out of their misery. Um, probably for me, probably Jax, just because uh, WWE narrative when it comes to certain things. You don't release The Rock's family. <laughs> it's just how it is. So let's yeah. let's go through these one by one because Nia Jax is obviously f- first and foremost. Um, there's a part of me that's happy she's gone. She's terrible. If we're looking at a person based on talent, fundamentals, marketability, charisma, character, she's terrible. Objectively, she's bad at her job. She's big, and they I think the height of her usage was when they were doing the whole body positivity thing and, you know, um, trying to be uh, like, like very progressive and look, she's big, but she's beautiful. And yeah, and it didn't work. No one cared. Everyone was just, yeah. Nah. Also didn't help that she was in an angle where she was getting bullied by arguably one of the smallest women, if not the smallest woman on the main roster in Alexa Bliss. Yeah, but this is five nothing, if that. <laughs> so, like, what, oh my God, your words hurt me so much. I can't do anything. No, just fucking run her over and be like, what? What? What'd you say? Bliss is Smalls and Jax was O'Doyle. Okay, like it's just... <laughs> O'Doyle rules. So, exactly. her departure doesn't really matter. Then we have fucking Carrying Cross and Scarlet Bordeaux. I find this funny because he was such a schmuck leaving Impact with all the things that he refused to do and, and all that gibberish that he was spouting. And 
you know, he, he was like, oh, yeah, you know, they need to pay Scarlett more and she has to work a second job and oh, boo-hoo. But now he's gone and no one's going to pay them the money that they're making in WWE. So, like, what is he going to do? Like, anywhere he goes, he's going to have to take less and he's going to have to look like a schmuck because he made such a big stink on his way out. Now, AEW is probably going to come calling for him in Bordeaux, but frankly, I don't understand the hype around Cross. I, at first, I did when he was just a shooter, but then they tried to make him like this goth dude, and oh, he's so dark, and I'm just like, ugh. Yeah, I don't buy it. <laughs> like a, like a two-legged stool. I ain't buying it. So I don't see them as a loss at all. And then he got called up and put in that stupid helmet. And listen, he had no personality or charisma anyway. He's a very generic guy. So, like, at least they tried something with him. Bordeaux was the only reason to invest in him outside of an in-ring perspective. So not having her, like, killed his entire mystique. It's, it's the same thing with Mike Bennett. Maria is what makes Mike Bennett as a character interesting. In-ring, he's good. But as a personality, he's just very, pff, whatever. Same thing with, with, with Cross, at least in my opinion. Marcus Cross, you, what's your thought? Are you sad to see him go? Do you think he'll pop up in AEW or somewhere else, perhaps? Yeah, it's weird. Like, I, I haven't really felt anything significant with Cross since his uh, time in Impact. He was doing his thing there, and then obviously that, that exit was not the best. Um, um, I loved anything scholar related. Um, I think as most people do, but then obviously he went to NXT. He had his over mystique about him that, that went along. I mean, it was the whole thing. The music, the entrance. NXT has always been good with smoke and mirrors when it's coming to entrances and, and certain character mystiques. And obviously a lot of that was his, it was Scarlet. And then it's almost like somebody looked at him and, and wanted to prove a point like, this guy wouldn't be shit without her. <laughs> hey, and then took her and then just they main rostered him and then you know he, he basically died of death so he was this type of monster in NXT and I, I, I'm definitely with you in the fact that it's like well as, as good as the guy is in certain instances essentially he's overhyped in mm -hmm. a lot of ways because um, I don't think he's dynamic as as you know he was portrayed to be and you, like I said, and like you said, you take away that scarlet element, and it's kind of like it's not like he's Samoa Joe or old when he first came to Impact. So it's like I don't know, man. He got a certain look about him. He he <laughs> he can do those Mr. Potato Head angry eyes, but other than that, I don't know, man. I don't know. Like I said, with what they had him doing, they might have did him a favor in the long run. Yeah. I find it ironic that you go with Mr. Potato Head because there's a part of me that thinks anyone who likes him or, or thinks that he's a um, charismatic individual, like, like if you do, that's fine. But part of me is, is going to think, man, you uncultured swine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, Ham, Oi. I'm Picasso. Ugh, I don't get it. You uncultured swine. <laughs> That internet culture, Jed. All you had to do was appear to be badass. Well, that explains TikTok. <laughs> speaking, uh, uh, speaking of TikTok, TikTok, they tried to give Keith Lee a nickname, Bearcat. That didn't work. I don't know why anyone's surprised. Like, this is who the company is. They're they're garbage people, and they hire and fire people because they're gar garbage people. Keith Lee is someone who I think kind of falls in that carrying cross camp of very talented in the ring, but I don't know what he has to offer outside of it. But a lot of people like uh, uh, Keith Lee. I don't understand necessarily the hype around it. Like I, I, I've been trying to figure out for eight years why Keith Lee is seen as Keith Lee. Technician-wise, great. Good, good, in the, good in the ring. But like, what is Keith Lee's personality like what makes him marketable what makes him the thing you want to enjoy i i feel like he's got that want to like you aidas going uh, for himself but I, I i think there may be something more there but I, I don't know but in ring wise he's a hell of a hand but he's not exactly charismatic like you think of like biggie 
Him and Big E are similar in build, size, in ring style. But Big E has a very bombastic personality, while Keith Lee is very calm and, and I don't want to say quiet, but there's a almost reserved nature about his, his presence. He's not very in your face, he's not very flashy. And I feel like part of the thing with Keith Lee is that WWE saw that and they didn't see too much potential in him. And I don't disagree with that to an extent. Like, same thing with Karrion. Like, I don't know what beyond the, oh, he bad, do you have with him? And I feel like with, with Keith Lee, there's a similar situation there. But also, on the other hand, you need a bolstered roster, right? You need guys like Cross and Keith Lee, guys who can work, guys who can wrestle, guys who can appeal to a specific demographic. Because, like, I don't know who Karrion was, was, was targeted towards, but people liked him for a reason. I don't know. So to let all these guys go from your main roster when you need time to fill is quizzical, to say the least. Marcus, I, I, I don't want to assume, but I, 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 I will. I think you're a big Keith Lee guy, or at the very least, you're a moderate Keith Lee guy. Does this release shock you the most? Yeah, no. Um, I think, yeah, because essentially they they repackaged him again. And also we had heard what he'd gone through personally. Um, and then thankfully he got past that because he could have lost his life. Mm-hmm. Um, but when he first came with his engine, when he first came through, coming through NXT, I didn't get, he had a lot of hype around him from the indie scene when I first saw him. I mean, obviously he has the size and the look of, and then just that big man that's about him. But I didn't really see any appeal. And the irony is, I think he almost was damn near let go because he really wasn't catching on the way that he needed to. And then something switched. And I think something about his aura changed. He got a little bit more bravado about his skill set and just the, the big guy that he was. And then things started to move. And then eventually that climaxed to him being the first ever NXT champion along with the North American Championship. And then he had that run with Roman and then with Brock and that whole deal. And then he, you know, had to drop the belt and ran into the wall that is the main roster. And it's just, it was all downhill from there, back and forth. Um, he had a big win against Orton, but at this point, I mean, that only mattered for that moment. And then nobody probably even remembers he beat Orton at this point. So the start and stop stuff, the changing his look, changing his music unnecessarily, Yet another person who got main roster to death. And, yeah, like I said, he's another person that ultimately I think they ended up doing a favor. I think they could have did a lot more with him than uh, Cross just because I just think he had a spark about him when you saw him in the ring with the likes of Reigns and the likes of Lesnar. And uh, he didn't necessarily need a valet or anything associated with him. So, But I think this ultimately helped him in the long run, you know. He'll probably pop up in AEW, I would imagine. I know everyone's going to be gun, gunning for him and trying to get him, but <clears throat> I have to imagine AEW. Because, like, AEW is kind of the pulse of the hardcore fans. Like, if, if hardcore fans like you and you get let go, you'll probably end up in AEW. And I feel like that's Keith Lee in a nutshell. He's a, he's a very big um, – his fan base is very big in the hardcore fan base realm. So I could easily see him popping up there. So, eight years later, Ke- uh, not Keith Lee, uh, Eva Marie is finally no longer with the WWE. Granted, she hadn't been for some time, but she came back in, what, 2016, and then she came back again this year. Never really learned to work. I think she was on WrestleMania this year facing off with, um, what's her face? Uh, Alexa Bliss. But for the most part, I don't feel like she's ever done anything. And she's not exactly some spring chicken. She's 37. You know, most of these guys that got let go are, are up there. Like, Carrion was 36. Let's see what Keith Lee was. I think Keith Lee was 36 as well. Keith Lee is 37. He just turned 37. He got released three days before his birthday. That's a dick move. <laughs> That is a dick move. Uh, let's see. Ember Moon is probably 35. 33. <clears throat> so these are some of the older talents I got released. I know Mia Yim's in her 30s. 
They released all the couples, man. That, that's fucked up. Or maybe not. I don't know. Medium's 32, turning 33 next year. Let's see who else. Uh, I know Grand Metalik and Lindsay Dorado are in their 30s already because they've been around for a little while. Let's see. Grand Metalik is 33. Lindsay Dorado is 34. So, yeah. I, these are all dudes in their 30s. And, and, and I, I guess you could say that they have all peaked in terms of what they can be. Oni Larkin's 35. He'll turn 36 this year. Frankie Monet's 38. Davey Boy, I think, is... Dave Boy Jr., I think, is uh, 37. Let me see. 36 turning 37, so... Obviously, there is an age component to some of these bigger names, and part of me understands, you know... They're trying to get younger, and most of the roster is pushing 40. So I get it. Like, how old is AJ Styles? 46? Cena's in his 40s. Brock Lesnar's in his 40s. Randy Orton's in his, in, uh, his 40s. Who else? Uh, Biggie's in his late 30s, I would imagine. Kofi's pushing 40. Let's see. Biggie is 35. We'll turn 36. Kofi. I think Kofi's 38. Kobe's 40. So, <clears throat> Rey Mysterio's in his late 40s. There's a lot of old talent on this roster. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because some of these individuals like Kofi, Rey Mysterio, they still go. Yeah. But on the flip side, they're also in their 40s and you're trying to appeal to a younger demo because your average age, I think, is like 53 for your viewership. So that tells you exactly who's watching your product. And it ain't, it ain't the youth of tomorrow. And you want that youth factor. You want the, the TikTok generation. And you want it because you want to be around in 10 years. And in 10 years, most of your viewership's going to be dead. <laughs> so, like, you know, you need to get younger. And even Marie being 37, I think, is kind of an indicative indictment on this company and their inability to create new stars. You know, she's not even a star, and they had to go back to that well. So, it's fascinating to me to see that they are, are basically adjusting their prerogative in talent midstream, essentially. And I think that's interesting because we're watching it in real time, <clears throat> a youth kind of uh, takeover, if you will, coming into the product right now. Obviously led by guys like Bronchen or Steiner. Uh, I forget what it is. Uh, Braun Breaker. Oh. It's not a great name, but at least it's a name you'll remember. So uh, that's, that's bad. Okay. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, all of it, she was, uh, the, narr the narrative around her center was her beauty, but it's like she's not, you put on this roster, she's not even the most beautiful girl on the roster, and that's not taken away. I mean, she's a very nice looking woman, but like, it, it, she just. It's not like the belt of the ball or anything, and then you bring her back in the era where it's not like you still have total divas going. And then you got in a, in a, a gimmick with uh, spotted dude drop who is literally far more talented than her, but you you know you un, you cut her off. Uh, that is, and uh, I think a lot of more people is crash as it may come off at this point in the game. It'd be like I think I liked her better as a character. When she was having a bunch of wardrobe malfunctions. I mean, yes. <laughs> I, I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> oh, if, it, if for no other reason, then it, it went with the fact that she couldn't wrestle. At least they were, you know, protecting her. I think she still has some appeal, though. Um, but it depends on how you use her. You, trying to build a wrestling promotion around her or a women's division isn't going to work. But if you can find the right attitude, the right accoutrements, the right wrestlers, the right stable, the right company, I think you could find a second life to Eva Marie. And I'm, I'm hoping that's kind of where they go uh, if she does stay in wrestling because who, who knows what she wants to do. I, I think seeing her kind of land in another company might give her the best opportunity to show what she is capable of doing because we don't really know. Truthfully, like the way they the WWE did her, <clears throat> you you really can't say anything good about it. Um, granted, I don't know how how serious she ever was about her craft, but 
you know, she was serious enough to get a second look by the company, so maybe. Um, Scarlet Bordeaux. Yeah, I mean, you know. Oh, sorry, go on. No, I was saying real quick, because we, we saw what happened with Maria with Impact. Mm-hmm. Well, just in general, but but that also is she knew what it was. She knew what her, you know, um, I'm not going to say her lane, because that just bad verbiage, but she knew pros and cons were, and she always, you know, stuck heavy to her pros, and that that's her, you know, her presence, her look, her mic skills, the whole character around her. Like, she had a, like, a year and a half long beef with Gail Kim, and she never touched him. And it was, it was some captivating TV. So I don't know if, but also Maria wasn't necessarily looking to prove nothing in the ring either, because she knew that just wasn't a thing. I don't know if something could be said about Eva, who I think may have very well got treated in that that old diva's fashion of okay you look this good we're gonna throw you in there with the with the wolves and just get in where you fit in and i think she maybe wanted to come back and prove something wrestling wise and they just put in a situation where she was annoying from a character perspective and by the time she did get in the ring nobody cared anyway so i do believe just like we've seen maria and others that she can find a spot but not in WWE. That's just not. It's not going well. No, no, it's not. I do think there's an opportunity for people like Scarlet, not Scarlet, um, Eva Marie, but it all depends on who picks her up yeah. and how they intend on using her. As for yeah. Scarlet, similar boat, but more authentic to the wrestling fandom because she's been with pro wrestling since Ring of Honor and. 2011, 2012. She was trained by Jimmy Jacobs. She's not a great worker by any means. She's not very athletic, but she's tenured. Like people see her and they're like, "Yeah, she's one of ours." Like while Eva Marie was a fitness model, turned um, a reality show model, turned pro wrestler, so she had that Miz factor about her, where people saw her as an outsider. Scarlett doesn't have the same dogma against her. She doesn't have the same rhetoric against her. Uh, but I still don't think that Scarlett's going to come in and be a great wrestler for whoever signs her. So you got to find other ways of using her and promoting her. Uh, but Impact has kind of given you the template on how to do that. And I think, you know, in that regard, they're going to be fine. That said, I don't see long-term appeal about this. So you're going to have to find the right way to use her so she can have a longer shelf life because just being the hot one isn't enough. Eventually, there's going to be someone younger someone who's holding up better, and you're going to lose that hot one mystique. But if you can find a way to be a great character, one yeah. that isn't reliant on sexuality, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you have to be more than just one note to survive in wrestling. If she can find that character that, that propels her forward, she could be like the next sensational Sherry. So it's important that she finds that, that next niche. But I, I don't know if... if, if Staying with caring is is the way to do it. She yeah, and I, I get the appeal, you all. Yeah, and I, I get. I mean, it's cool to see so many couples in wrestling actually getting a chance to work together. Um, but, I mean, I think a different conversation could be had on a different day about the varying degrees of success that's worked for those individual couples. But um, yeah, I think I think one thing that Scarlett has is a presence about herself. Um, obviously she's stunning, but like you said, there's always somebody, um, what was the old saying for a lot of people like such and such and such and such, there's a hottie graduating college right now. Like people, uh, talk about dating, dating older and younger and whatnot. And I think with her, obviously the smoke show thing, I think that's something very easy for her to do. Um. But obviously, we did see her do some energy and stuff in Impact, and that was serviceable for what that was um, in the interim. But I, I would, if she went back to Impact, which I doubt, because like I said, the, the whole, like you said, the, the caring father, I don't know how that would work, but we've seen stranger things happen. I wouldn't want to see her going for the media title against Jordan and Grace. That's a mismatch. Like, that's, that's, that's a mismatch. Um, and like you said, it's, it's kind of hard to just be the hot one when you have names like Deanna Parrazzo, Jordan Grace, who have all the wrestling skills and they're hot while not necessarily trying that hard in character. Like, they just come off that way. Mm-hmm. Like, do it, like, 
Florida and Grace is just thick, and then obviously anybody that endeavors to anything she's doing offline, can, you know, obviously. But Deanna has that, um, and a lot of other performers. So I don't know what would be her niche individually. I think she could find it, but I, I don't know if she necessarily wants to be separated from, from Cross, you know? Yeah. So. And, and and that's fair, you know. When you're with someone, it's never good for a relationship to be away from them. <laughs> so I, I, I completely yeah. get that. Um, but you can build one hell of a women's division with the talent they release. Now, I don't know too much about B-Fab as far as what she can yeah. do in the ring, but Ember Moon, Taya Valkyrie, Scarlett Bordeaux, uh, Mia Yim. I'm, I'm not going to say Naya. No, never. <laughs> But like you, can, you can start building a great foundation of a women's division. Or if you're someone like Impact, who already has a strong women's division, those three or four talents could come in and really give you a different perspective. So, by the by, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the uh, the inspiration stuff this week on Impact. Did you see it? No, I got I got to catch up on that. Uh, <laughs> I really got yeah. Post BFG, I got the two shows to catch up on. They, but uh, I'm definitely looking forward. The inspiration. They, they 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 ran into uh, <laughs> Rosemary and Havoc, and mm. they spend the like all their segments trying to figure out the best way to deal with these ghosts. And I I, I don't know their names. I, I I'm I, I'm bad with names, but the uh, uh, I don't know how, how how best to describe this. Um, the more slender of the two. She's like seeing all the gotcha. ghosts and shit, and the other one's like, "Oh no, no, like you're, like you're crazy. This isn't happening." And then she starts to see him. They're like, "All right, well, where do we go to find ways to deal with ghosts?" And they and um, uh, Mackenzie, not Mackenzie, uh, but the the ring announcer girl, or the uh, backstage uh, interviewer girl. She's like, uh, "You can find the undead uh, bridesmaids," uh, and they're like, "Well, where do we find them? Uh, in the darkest parts of the building?" And the one's like, oh, "I don't know about going to the darkest part of the building. That seems like a bad idea." <laughs> And it was just very fun. And, like, this is where they, they shine. They're very charismatic. Oh, yeah, because they're they the perfect. And even if you don't like them as characters and certain as performers, I understand. But they are the perfect um, offset to the decay stuff. Because mm-hmm. they got 100% playing to the dumb, you know, did say, oh, my God. Like, oh, my God, what is this, Carol? Like, that that whole deal. And I love how Impact always, in some form of, of actual logic, plays back into the whole Undead Realm stuff. Mm-hmm. Like they always find a way to bring the Sue Young stuff into it. They always always find a way to, to, to hilariously, but logically, and some, for as logical as you can get with it, bring back in Father Mitchell. Because um, they either need to turn somebody's darkness up or bring somebody back from the dead. Or make a deal. Got a lot of those deals with Father Mitchell. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, they're the perfect, perfect fools for it. It's only a matter of time before they run into the swing, man, which we're all waiting for. So. Oh, that's going to be great. I can't wait for that. <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, speaking of can't wait, Mia Yim, I think she's one of the few names that you can pretty much bookmark for a return to impact. Her run in NXT has been bad. Um Part of the issue is like everyone's like, well, she, she's a really good worker and, and you know, she's always fun to watch. And yeah, fair. But you got to understand that a pro wrestler has to treat their career like a musician treats their albums. If you don't have hits and, and, and things that bring people back, then, then you don't have anything. Like Bret Hart had how many great feuds? You know, how many great matches did Shawn Michaels have? Did Ric Flair have? Did... Kofi Kingston have with, with the New Day. Like, Booker T, they all have these chunks where you can be like, oh, yeah, when Booker was doing the, the best of five stuff or best of seven stuff in WCW with Benoit, that was when Booker arrived. But then you can also, like, when Booker was, was Gold Dust, when Booker was doing King Booker, when he was in his home country of Africa in TNA. In my home country of Africa. <laughs> I gotta find that episode, Marcus. I gotta find that episode. Oh, no, you, no, you do. We got that. The freaking funerals. We got to. We need to hold. Just ah, oh, I don't know how you didn't do that for Halloween, Impact. Right. But um. 
but with Mia, it's like she had the dollhouse in Impact, and that was that was fine. But then she had her feud with Rosemary, and I feel like that was when she really ascended. Yeah. And then she goes to NXT, and I can't name one great feud she had. And it's not because she's not talented. Me, I'm one of the best workers in the world. Yeah. So how she ended up going, and this isn't just me, like by any means. This is an indictment on NXT. Like you had Gargano and Ciampa, you had Keith Lee and Dijakovic for a, for a, a hot moment. Uh, you know the FTR and whoever, but like most of their big rivalries with the women. We're, we're with the fucking four horsewomen or whatever the fuck we're calling them. Like, it was Bailey, yeah. Charlotte, Becky, and Sasha. Like, those were the four. And, and after yeah, they left, and their division went to shit. And then, I mean, they, they basically profited on the back of Asuka with her undefeated streak mm-hmm. down there. Yep, Asuka had a so great so run. She yeah, she, had to, she retired the belt. Um, but... Yeah, after that it was kind of kind of up and down, and and it, and it's funny because people like Mia Yim, Bianca Belair, um, I think, because I mean I, I think we talked about, but Ember Moon, who's a, a big favorite of mine, ours. They all were at uh, big favorite of mine. Uh, ours, excuse you. <laughs> Oh look, ours. Oh, I didn't know. Okay, that. Well, we meet again, friend. We we meet again. She she's but, definitely um, a friendship ender. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> for 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 those that don't know, a friendship ender is someone that you're willing to end a friendship over. <laughs> and granted, she already. I think yeah, she's we, married. Yeah, we, and we've named a, we've named a, a couple friendship enders over the years. Yes. Uh, and I can't wait to get the Army of Thieves just so I can watch Nathalie Emmanuel for however long that movie goes. Uh, oh, God. No, yeah. <laughs> like, she's the only reason I'll ever watch a Fast and the Furious movie. <laughs> ever. Uh, Although, but, um, um, Batista's daughter in that, um, I forget her name, Ella Purnell, I think. She, she 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 and Nathalie Emmanuel are like mm hmm yes please yes please I am oh, wow. very eclectic gotcha gotcha it's that that eyes. not ever that makes sense it's those <laughs> eyes, man oh my god yeah but see, these these perfect I mean I'm thinking about it now that would be such a great feud between a Mia Yim and a and a Ember Moon because they're you know they're not the biggest but they you know they can go. In any scenario, and not to just pigeonhole of what she did in Impact, but to see her go from that dollhouse to evolve, to evolving in Jade, and she had like an all-time feud in the Knockouts division with Rosemary. Mm-hmm. And she, like you said, it wasn't a talent thing when NXT. She just she fell into that group, like I said, with the Biancas and the, and the Ember Moon. So I think was NXT Women's Champion at a point. But um, I think when she came back after that atrocious run she had on the main roster, where she almost had a career-ending injury running running after the damn 24-7 title, um, she came back and reinvented herself, and I thought this would have been a great avenue to put the belt back on her. But they, they did a lot of bridesmaids, but no bride briding with her, mm-hmm. kind of like they did with Becky. She's the only one of the four horsewomen. It's weird. She it feels like she had the least amount of success in NXT of them, but had but has had the most well, right under Charlotte on the main roster. I think um, you could argue that Becky's that. had the most success financially. Yeah. So, Ember Moon held the belt for 140 days, and she lost to Shauna Baszler. Shauna Baszler. Oh, yeah, there, there, there it is. Yeah. But, which, is, which is not bad. I mean, can literally choke you out. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's fine. But she never got it back. Um, and I think she got sent back down in the summer of June. Like the summer of 2020, yeah. I mean. Um, but I don't know when she returned to wrestling. So here's who Ember Moon lost the belt to, and then everyone since then. Basler, Kyrie Sane, who lost it to Basler again. Ray Ripley, which is fine. Charlotte... L- Io Shirai, who held it for 304 days, and I like Io Shirai. She's very talented. But can I just say this, and maybe you'll agree, but talk about the most wasted title run ever. 
She held the belt for 304 days, and I cannot name one match that even popped up. It, even Baszler's first run or and second run had at least two or three matches that were like, all right, yeah, because Baszler had a great match with uh, Bianca Belair, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And it was like a... <sighs> like, Belair was like, all right, listen, you were in MMA, that's dope, but like I'm going to throw some forearms, and you're going to taste some nastiness, and that's exactly what you did. I was like, that's impressive. But I was sure I had none of that. Like she may have had some good matches. Like I'm not saying that. Like, but there's a difference between having a good match and having a match that's remembered. And you don't have those every day. But the great ones always find a, a, a way to get one or two. Kyrie saying same thing. Ember Moon same thing. They don't have that one standout match. Maybe Rhea Ripley has one, but I I, I don't I don't think so. Ra- or Kel Gonzalez talk about just one of the most. Like, who are you? I don't know. Like you're just there. And then Mandy Rose. Like why is Mandy like why is Mandy Rose on this fucking roster? Like I I, I don't I don't get it. I I, I it makes no it's, it's sense. It's the two It's the it's the two point ness of it all. At this at this point, like a lot of stuff that's happening in two uh in the two point oh era kind of feels like um like how you used to say when we used to um cover the comics when you just say like look i love bruce wayne and batman but what he did handstands or, or setups and uh like 200 degree heat you're like that's some batman shit. Uh, <laughs> you, just, you, can't, you can't explain batman logic it's not even like don't try to explain it like, oh no you give him time and preparation no that's just batman shit batman that's is that hanging, bad shit he's hanging off the tower of of wayne enterprises like he's hanging off the side of wayne enterprises 100 stories up and he's doing like one arm pull ups in 120 degree heat. What the fuck? That's a Superman thing. It's not even a Superman oh. thing. Superman wouldn't be that stupid. <laughs> man, DC Comics has really just let themselves go. Just oh, terrible. man. So, yeah, Mandy Rose is, is, is still there. Um, Lucha House Party, Grand Middle League, and Lindsay Dorado. I don't think you're, you know, they're going to go into AAA, I think. Or maybe uh, CMLL. I don't see them sticking around in the States. Especially not Grand Metal League. Because he was, uh, I think he was an impact for a moment. And then he uh, signed up with the WWE. And then Lindsay Dorado. I don't think he was an impact. Where did you come from? Yeah. Because I think, well, Impact had Laredo Kid Mm -hmm. and some people. Dorado did uh, an exhibition dark match in 2012 and then took parts in the extravaganza tapings, wrestling in a seven-man escape match, which was ultimately won by Christian York. Then he signed with WWE in 2016. So let's see. Grand Metalik was in New Japan. CMLL. <clears throat> so I got these flipped. It was Grand Metalik who wasn't an impact. I don't see either of them going uh, sticking in America, though. I think they're both going to end up going down back to, excuse me, back to Mexico, which may, they, may, may be best for them. Yeah, it gets them back in the environment. They, y'all obviously, they get the respect they deserve and not seen as some, you know, uh, goofball trio, because all those guys can go. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just, it's it's never going to be taken as seriously as it should be, because that, that it's that E in the, in the company, so. Yeah, um, one time for <laughs> when I saw the list, I was like, "Oh crap, it's Malik! They got Malik! <laughs> they got Malik!" Oh man, Dorado's from Puerto Rico, not Mexico. So to clarify, I don't think he wrestled in Puerto Rico though. It says he wrestled in Chikara. Chikara's no longer around. By the by, I just want to say this before we move on. I just found some photos of Ember Moon from like her indie days. Had like the baby face still. Oh, she's adorable. <laughs> well, she was a thing on the on the energy circuit, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> I wonder what she's gonna go by now that she's free. Like OBJ. That'd be so cool. That'd be so that'd be so cool if Impact got Yim and Moon to sign. God, I hope so. No. Oh, that'd be awesome. That. That con- that conjoined pool of the all age talent and now these guys, that's man, Jesus Christ. 
I think we're going to see a few of these names back in Impact. I think Mia Yim's going back. Uh, Ember Moon, I think, is going to pop up in AEW at some point, but I wouldn't be surprised if she was uh, in AEW in Impact at some point. Um, and then Oni Lorcan is next. I don't see him going. I think he's going to end up in New Japan, um, probably uh, the uh, Strong, which is the U.S. arm. I could see Oni Lorcan there. Uh, Lorcan, to me, is, is another guy. Great in-ring worker. No personality. Um, in, in, in the right yeah. facet, though, like that can work. But when you have so mm. many of that type, it's like yeah. you, don't, you don't want a thousand Dalton Castles who's all flamboyant and all, you know, pomp and circumstance, but you also don't want a thousand Bret Hart's either. You need to have a mix. So yeah. I, I feel like yeah, Biff is, is in NXT. He was among so many of his ilk because he had Tommaso Ciampa, T- Johnny Gargano, Pete Dunne. He had so many guys who were just like him. And you can't stand out like that. Yeah, no. And I think I think putting them with Danny Birch was a stroke of brilliance because they both have similar looks, similar styles, and they they are consummate workers. Um, and you put them together, they made a hell of a tag team. And certainly, if you weren't gonna have them eventually be champions, they always they together they kind of stood like as the tag team version of Ishii. Mm-hmm. Was like, oh, I got to go. Not today. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not in the mood for no Ishii in this today. I just want an easy match, quick win, the La, La, La Mahi Straw. There ain't going to be no La Mahi Straw days with Ishii and, and guys like Danny Burch and, and uh, like you said, Big Music. So, um, yeah, I think they'll be, you know, perfectly fit in, in New Japan and stuff like that. Like guys like him, you know, you put in, in situations like the G1 or the um, other tournaments like that. Next up, we have Frankie Monet, the former Ty of Valkyrie. She's another one, like, uh, Oni Larkin's 35, Frankie Monet is 38. Uh, so, again, they, they fall in the trend of WD getting rid of the older stars. Here's the thing with Frankie Monet. Um, if we're talking about, you know, Taya in 2012, 2013, 2014, when she joined Lucha Underground and she was very svelte, she had a very different wrestling style then. She was a lot more in the Lucha Libre style, uh, you know, bigger bumps, a, a lot of, like, um, hip tosses and, and uh, arm drags and all that stuff, which is, it doesn't look high velocity or high impact, but for the person taking it, it is. Like, as we always say, Mark, especially you, there's only so many bumps on one's bump card. Uh-huh. So, so it's not a style that's conducive. It's, it's one of the reasons why a lot of Mexican wrestlers start in that style, but then transition into more of an American pro wrestling style. Like, look at Blue Demon. When he was in Lucha Underground, he wasn't wrestling that way. Mil uh, uh, Muertes. He wasn't wrestling that way, but they all start that way. Or at least that's kind of like, like the idea is like so many of them start that way. But looking at Taya Valkyrie, when she came into Impact, she put on 40 or 50 pounds of muscle. You know, she started powerlifting and she changed her style up completely. She, she, nowhere near as athletic as she once was. But she's fallen into a new pattern or a new kind of mindset that has allowed her to extend her career past the point of, of limitations on, athletes, on athleticism. So even though she's no longer the same athletic individual, she's still a very good worker because she adapted, which is what you should do. Everyone does. Look at Sting. Sting Absolutely. was high, high impact, high velocity for a lot of years, and then when he goes crow, he becomes more methodical. He slows down, but he yeah. makes his punches look more aggressive. He looks, it makes the slams look more ferocious. So when he does do a top rope dive at some point it, it seems to have more impact and that's something uh, uh ty of valkyrie has done yeah so where yeah, she does no, hulk, you know. no i'm sorry go on no i was saying and he has a better hulk up than hulk hogan <laughs> that's for damn sure <laughs> so seeing ty of valkyrie yeah she's 38 but she doesn't wrestle like it she wrestles like she's 28 so i don't see her being a a bad investment for another company now aw might come calling for her who knows she may be interested in that. But I really think that with Impact's knockouts division, as it stands right now with Mickey James in there, Mercedes Martinez, I think you can bring back Ty Valkyrie in any number of roles. Like, she's the perfect, like, I don't, Marcus, have you ever played NCAA football, college football uh, on, like, PlayStation or something like that? Yeah. Do you remember, like, when you were recruiting guys, you would always have that class of guys called the athlete and you can change yeah. their position. That's what I feel mm-hmm. like Taya Valkyrie is. She can be quarterback, running back, receiver, corner, safety. She can come in yeah. and be oh. the mean girl. 
She can come in and be the power girl. She can come in and be the, the ice queen. She, she is so good yeah. at playing a character that she's limitless. And I feel like bringing her in as a personality is tantamount to landing a, a, a number one overall draft pick. Signing Drew yeah. Brees for, for, for you Saints fans. So I would like to see her back in that okay. because she can fit in any other way. I'm, man, I'm I'm right there. With, look, man, Ro, uh, Ty, if you're hearing this, please come back and and rescue Rosemary from Havoc, please. Please, <laughs> y'all got y'all had like I didn't necessarily click with her as much when she was doing the whole Hollywood um, dog, you know, dog on the invisible, well, an invisible dog on a leash thing. But then they brought Bravo in that, and I thought they had an entertainer back and forth. But then they evolved it, and her and Rosemary clashed, and then they came together. I'm like, this is, this tag team is brilliant. And then, just when I feel like they was getting some real momentum, she obviously. But they could always work. <laughs> like the fact that she was the one that was, because there was a video that what they framed her for Bravo's thing, but it was Rosemary. Yeah, because she was trying to steal his virginity. Yes, yes, and then they had the, the guy from Double XL mixed up in that whole thing. That was hilarious. But uh, back in then, like you said, she could obviously come back looking for the impact title because of it, uh, knockout side because of everything that Deanna's been doing and seeing Mickey James and getting that do that whole thing. Or she could rescue Rosemary from freaking havoc. Like like you said, she's an all purpose player, and to see her evolve from like you said, like there were points in Lucha Underground like. She was still in scenes from Dario Cueto in those office uh, scenes because, I mean, I, I don't even want to explain it. Just go back and watch it. Um, just not like the first 20 episodes. Yeah. Skip that. <laughs> <laughs> like, just go back and watch those scenes. and that all, like She was a whole different character, different demeanor. Like you said, she was uh, smaller, had a whole different kind of swag. But seeing the evolution of her, I think, has been brilliant. And, again, all the great ones change their style according to where they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, Miss James. Uh, so, yeah, I, I hope, you know, we get specifically names like her. I don't know to call her Jade. I, I think Jade would be cool as somebody to come back with. I mean, Mia Yim's fine. So I'm hoping that's how it goes. But, yeah, they definitely tired could come back. Um, even really is it either gimmick the war queen like you said which I thought was brilliant when she first came um, there or like you said the the because Bravo still would but Swinger Palace is dead well you also have so. the the inspiration and Emma or not Emma what's her name um, Tennille Dashwood you have Caleb with a K like J- uh, Johnny Bravo still there Johnny Swingers they're like there's a lot of guys and gals there that kind of fit in that modern social media type so like her yeah. coming back in as the character she was when she left makes utmost sense you have so many like-minded personalities it's like you know having a, a teen sitcom drama uh, uh with um riverdale and you're like oh well we can get luke perry luke perry fits perfectly in this genre because he made his name in the, in this genre you know same thing with uh, molly ringwald it's so like, yeah, these make absolute sense to bring in because they have history in this genre. Same thing with Taya. She has history in this style of gimmick. On the flip side of things, if you feel you have too much of that gimmick, she's proven to be very versatile. So you can do something with Rosemary. You can do something completely different. And I feel like it would work. And I feel like that's like one of the reasons why EC3 has failed. Because he didn't really get to you know, do his whole EC3 thing to the degree in which he probably deserved to do it in Impact. And now he's trying to do the narrative and no one gives a shit. But with Taya, I feel like if she did something old again, if she went a little bit older than old, if she went new completely, I feel like all of it would work because she has proven herself to be very versatile. So here's hoping. So this one is is the most heartbreaking. Uh, Davey Boy Smith Jr. left MLW to join WWE. And, <clears throat> well, it didn't go well. <laughs> He's already been cut, and I think he just signed, like, what, in, what, August? I want to say. D.B. Boy Smith Jr. Let's see. 
He's only 36, and he's been wrestling since 2004. He's been wrestling since 2000. Jesus, he's been wrestling since he was 15. Canada's got weird laws, man. Uh, he, ret- <laughs> he returned to... Let's see. It says he had just one match on July 16th and uh, on, on a dark match, and then he was released after that. Um, so maybe he got signed in the summer. He left uh, MLW at the end of 2020, so, you know, probably signed sometime in 2021. He's only 36, though. Like, that's insane to say out loud. Because he's been wrestling since turn of the century. We've watched him since 2006, 2007, because he debuted uh, uh, either alongside, like, not as a partner, but in the same era as Cody Rhodes or right before he signed in 2006 originally made some appearances in 2006 2007 2008 and then got called up in 2009 so yeah yeah him and cody rhodes were like that next crop of second third generation guys i would yeah, like to he, see he him debuted, go somewhere though yeah because he debuted with the, uh, as part of the hard fan of a kid right spiky crown kid he's just fucking forehead kid or whatever the fuck that haircut is <laughs> oh uh. I mean, kid try. It's a, like, it's a hair crown, damn it. It doesn't matter. Cut it. <laughs> um, he tried. But, yeah, I think I, 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 w- I almost wish he wouldn't have left because, I mean, MLW. Because I think MLW is like a perfect fit for a lot of guys. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's that major. It, it's, some of these guys really do feel like they got something to prove when they leave and then come back. But it's like. You, you can't really prove your worth to somebody who doesn't already, you know, you, you, you know, that whole thing. They don't see worth in you. You can't, you can't prove anything to them. So mm-hmm. I think he was supposed to be on SmackDown and it just, it just never went. And, and it sucks because like you say, he's 36. You know how to get the game go a lot of times. I don't know what injuries he's had, but you know, a lot of these guys are wasted a lot of time and he could have been killing it going back to new Japan. I was like, you say MLW, um, Impact would be a great name. It would have been cool to see him pop up in Ring of Honor. That's probably never going to be a thing now. Um, but he definitely could go somewhere because he's another guy that is completely different from what we saw when he was WWE faithful, I guess you would say, if they haven't seen him for years. He's completely different from that tag team guy. And the fact that they brought him back and then didn't see him as a valuable resource when most people who train because he trained in the hard dungeon, right? Yeah, he was one of the last people to and do they, so. And they and they hold that concept uh, was very real in wrestling in such a high regard. You would think that um, they would have used him, and maybe he would have been a better fit in somewhere like NXT with the Lorcans and other guys and stuff with the hard hitting stuff. But that would have been a wash too because he would have kind of came in on the tail end of things with the, the Gargano and Adam Cole era, which we weren't the biggest fans of. And uh, he probably would have eventually got washed out of this two point, this new 2.0 vision. So, you know. I think he would fit perfectly in Impact. Either, and I keep suggesting this because obviously, either as a Team Canada revival. <laughs> <laughs> Or if he signs up with, you know, Violent by Design, maybe he joins Bullet Club Impact. Who knows? There's a lot of possibilities uh, like, with Davey Boy. Like, I would love to yeah, see like, a, come a, on. A, a, an actual, like, 20, 25-minute feud, or not feud, but match with uh, Davey Boy and Joe Doring. That's yeah, I mean, come on. Day. Come on. Sad's on the ask for two things consistently. A Team Canada reunion, a good one. Yeah. And Davey Richards. And... and, and, and Exactly. It's only two things. He only asked for two things. Santa, he's only consistently asked for two things. It's not like I've been a fan consistently since your Inception impact. It just, 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 you know, something, please, anything. So I don't know most of these other names, but one I want to talk about only because she's fucking gorgeous. <laughs> um, Catalina Garcia, a.k.a. Katrina Cortez. Uh, I, I don't know if she's always been a masked luchador because apparently she was with Sin Cara at one moment. And when the fuck was Sin Cara still in 
that company. Probably the last set of uh, releases in 2020. Because uh, he, he got released not that long ago. I had to man. The real one or, or Negro? <laughs> <laughs> Marcus. <laughs> you can't say that word. Me. It was Booker. He told me to say it. <laughs> Booker, gave it you, okay. Booker gave you a Negro card pass? <laughs> He gave me the pass. <laughs> uh, no, Negro, yeah. Um, that's what I'm talking about. What was his name? Hum, uh, not Humberto. Um, he, he was with uh, Camacho. Did you say Anarchy? <laughs> <laughs> Anarchy, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, um, he, he was with uh, Tama Tonga. No, Tonga Lo, I'm sorry. When Tonga Lo was with WWE, um, that, that's Sin Cara. I forget his name. It's dumb, I'm sure. Hang on, let's see. Sin Cara Negro. Uh, talk about the dead feud. Hunico. That, that's what it was. Hunico. Yeah, dead, dead, dead. Wow, she really has a, and I hate to bring her name up, but she got that sexy star vibe where it's like, something tells me that, that face is gorgeous under that mask. Ah, it's gorgeous. It's well, gorgeous. And she does a smirk. I don't know what it is about smirks, but oh no! <laughs> Gets to see a little dimple, and she's all like, mm, "Pouty face," like, mm, "Okay." So I don't know if she's a masked wrestler, generally speaking, because I, I see stuff with her both wearing and not wearing a mask, uh, both on the indies and not on the indies. So like maybe, um, but yeah, I don't know anything about her outside of her brief run in WWE, and I would love to see a lot. More. She she she's definitely someone I hope Impact picks up. So, who knows? Hopefully, maybe it happens. Who's Rita Rice? Apparently, the Mercedes Martinez, Caterina Cortez, and Rita Rice were a thing. Rita Rice, Rice, Rice. I feel like some of these names. I'm like, what? Some of these names, a lot of the names that they were holding in that in that performance center that we talked about so many times. Mm-hmm. Cause I had never heard a lot of these names. Yeah, I, the rest of the names I have no idea about, so like we're not gonna put too much emphasis on this. But yeah, it's not great. This is what happens when you sign three hundred people to a roster for twenty minutes worth of content. <laughs> like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Okay, Marcus, let's let's wrap the show because we've already been on for an hour. And I knew this would happen. One final thing to talk about. Sinclair, they're the parent company of Ring of Honor, and they're in a lot of trouble. They, uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know, if you have a regional basketball or a regional baseball team like the Guardians, a.k.a. the Indians, the Cavaliers, Marcus has the Pelicans, um, Orlando Magic, uh, F- F- Miami Marlins, whoever. Most of them are going to be on something called uh, the Bally Sports Network, which is owned by Sinclair Broadcasting. That's their sports arm. Um, and apparently Sinclair has been trying to launch a baseball streaming service called the Diamond, Diamond Sports Group. <clears throat> and uh, it seems like they, they really thought that they were going to have something special with, with the streaming service and with baseball, but they ended up being, what was it, tw- tw- Twenty-one billion, twelve billion, I think it was twelve billion dollars in the hole. Eight point six billion of it was because of the streaming service. Now they are already forced to pay back lenders, and their first payment was for one hundred and eighty-four point four million dollars. So the streaming service is is not dead, but it's in limbo. They're now already paying back lenders who, who've invested in the streaming service. So the streaming service isn't making them any money. They still haven't finished it. And now they're paying everything back. Or at least they're starting to. And this is in part why Ring of Honor ended up having the issues that they had where they ended up letting go you know, so many of the individuals under their, their contracts. This isn't a good thing at all. Marcus, knowing what we know now about how bad off Sinclair Broadcasting is, what do you think Ring of Honor's future is? Do you think they're going to get sold? Um, finding out this new information uh, about their financial 
crater that they're in right now um it's likely um also we talked about before that the library was up for grabs but now hearing this is like because when you see the fact that they they put that much money into that when they could have funded a lot of that money through ring of honor to improve it far beyond